today, we are exalting the opportunity to study your world of Satan. To come together in your presence and to learn what you are about to teach us. But our Lord, your word is sufficient for us because we know your word is made perfect in weakness. When we are weak, you make us stronger. Holy Spirit, guide us with insight for this study. Help us as you teach us about the missionary church. We want to understand insights into the study of your work. How to grow in your fellowship and to have communion with you and to understand your presence from day to day. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today we are on a study known as the Missionary Church. But before we continue, my name is Missionary Collins. I am your host. And our teaching for today is the Missionary Church. Better if you have missed any of our topics, you can still see it on our website, cgfnslogin.app. Or you can search us on WhatsApp at CGF Open Apps. CGF Open House Fellowship. It's a non-denominational service. So we will be happy to receive you or for you to be able to watch all our past videos to learn presently. This in this self fellowship we normally divide the training into parts of training in order for it to be beneficial unto you. We have the salvation training, we have the mission training. We have the discipleship, leadership, and these four weeks we are focusing on church growth training. Last week we took the church. We took the we took the church growth. But this week we are taking the topic, the missionary church. And this topic, the missionary church. We'll be excited for your view, but we pray that God should help us to interpret it with wisdom and understanding. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, today, before we start, I want us to understand that our teaching for this week will be beneficial to every believer who cares to listen. And if you have missed any of our topic, you can still see it on our website. At CGF NS login. If you have any prayer request or personal question or messages, you can send it to our email at info at CGF NS login dot app. God bless you as we hear from you. Amen. So today, why we are day worshiping the Lord and fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, set apart so. Barnabas and Saul for the work of which I have prepared them. Who is Barnabas and who is Saul? Barnabas was the same man the Lord Jesus appeared to to deliver Saul when he was blinded on his way to Damascus. Saul was a persecutor of the church. His major job was to persecute the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and to ensure that the gospel of the kingdom was not being preached. And he goes about from city to city, arresting them that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring them to Antioch, to bring them to Jerusalem before the high priest to be persecuted. He himself was a Pharisee. But when he was arrested by the Lord, the Lord Jesus said something to him. So, so, why art thou persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against a God. So, so converted after his experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he decided to follow Jesus Christ, to preach the same message he won't persecute. And the missionary church is not different. No missionary was perfected since before they were saved. Remember what the Lord said. He said, remember your calling as believer. 
Not many wise men after the flesh were called. Not many nobles were called. God chose the foolish things of this world to confront the wise. He chose the weak and the fine things to confront the things which are mighty. And that's why God today decides to choose you who are nothing to confront the things that exist. And that's what we are. We are not the object of glory. In the missionary church, we understand that the missionary itself are not the object of glory. They are tools which the Lord used to bring about his work. When Jesus Christ met Saul, he told Saul that he will understand how much he had to suffer for his name. But this was Saul who were persecuting the church. Saul, whose delight was in taking the life of Christian or bringing them to Jerusalem to be persecuted by the chief priests. And in fact, when Stephen was being stoned to death, Paul was there, and the garment of those that stoned him were put at his feet. He was consenting to his death. Now, the Lord Jesus decided to use the same man who was the master in church persecution to bring about his gospel. Why did God not go for many of the saints in Israel? Many of those who were perfected as saints. Because God wants to use the foolish things of this present world to confront the things that we seem to be wise. He wants to use the things that are defined to confront the things that are holy. And that was why he used Paul as a tool for his feet. Because Paul acted in ignorance. He thought he was obeying God by killing or persecuting those believers. The same thing many of us today think when we persecute the saints, when we commit Christians to prison, when we kill them, we think we are doing the work of God. Even some people think it is in the name of the Lord that some missionaries should be killed or executed. But the church make us understand Paul visions make us understand that it is the Lord Jesus Christ we are persecuting. When we decide to persecute missionaries or attack Christians in our streets and in our street corner, it is not actually the Christians which we have problem with. It is Christ we are actually persecuting. Timothy Ken is the pastor in lesson one who taught 15 men every two months together and they saw over 100,000 new believers. He says that the church in China's art reservoir of people in preparation for the Great Commission. What do you need to do to launch the church into a world ministry? Because today we have a lot of building. And that most subsequently, our pastor go from ministry to ministry on invitation. But that does not still bring the church into a world ministry. Because the teams are left behind in such ministration. For missionary church to be successful, the team must have the same vision as the founder. And when the team has the same vision as the founder, they are able to launch the church into a global sphere. Because in a missionary church, everyone works. Remember what they did in Jerusalem. Before we continue, let's go to the Bible and read Acts chapter 11 from verse 19 to 30. Acts 11, 19 to 20. What does it say? Some of them were men of Cyprus. Now when they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose, 
about Stephen travail as far as Phoenix, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jewish only. And some of them were men of Cyrus, Caesarea, which, and when they were come to Antioch, spake unto Grecians and preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 21, and the Lord, and the hands of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. And then the tiding of these rich, of these things came to the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. What was the mission of Barnabas in Antioch? Because the church gathered together to send forth missionaries. Missionaries are not just a people who go from street to street evangelism. They are sent forth on a mission. And the mission is to save life. And they are given a mandate for a particular mission. The mission of Barnabas to Antioch. In verse 21. In verse 23. Who when he came, he had seen the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of the heart they should cleave unto the Lord. So now we understand in verse 22, 23, the mission of Barnabas. The mission of Barnabas was not a mission to convert the church in Antioch. It was a mission to strengthen the church, to disciple the church, and prepare them for the work of the ministry. That is the difference between an evangelist and a missionary. Evangelists go to broadcast seed, and when they go to broadcast seed, they broadcast seed to every location or every fair or every city they can find. But the job of the missionary is to go there to strengthen to plant the mission and to grow these people into a discipling church. That is the job of the missionary. And when they are grown into a discipling church, their mission is also complete when they are discipled. And when their missions are completed, they are sent forth to also go and into a various field and perfect a particular mission. Don't get me wrong. Your mission cannot only be to disciple in an existing church. Your mission can also be to evangelize a whole nation. And your mission can also be to introduce Christ to a people who have never heard about it. Your mission can also be to integrate a culture into Christianity and to be able to put Christian Jesus into the people's culture that could be your mission your mission could also be to regenerate a rotten church so that is a specific mission so missions are not the calling but it is the destination of the call servant of God when you are called, God does not call you and said, I called you into mission. No. Your call is specified to do, to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as God does not call you to say, I called you to go and build a church, and here is the name of the church. No. God called you to go and preach the gospel to all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is the call. Then the mission is the target. The destination of your goal. What message, what vision 
does the Lord give to you concerning the people he has called you to go and save? That is the mission. So that's why missions are not reserved for a special group. Missions are not reserved for evangelists or for pastors. Mission is for every believer that God called into the ministry. That's why in mission schools, we do not variate people or select people. The church understood the vision. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Let's go to Proverbs 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, from verse 18. I read, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. A servant, in verse 19, he said, A servant will not be corrected by word. For though he understand, he will not answer. So, that is what Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 and 19 says to us. Because where there is no vision, the people perish. The early church has a clear vision. As we understand in the scripture, that the early church has a vision. Their vision was to bring Christ to the entire world, to occupy him until he comes. That was the vision of the early church. Today, what is your vision? What is the vision of your church? What message is your church spreading to the world? The church needs proper vision. Because why do, without a vision, the people perish. And above all, senior leaders need to pick up God's heart for a world of different people. To go see for himself every year what impresses him or her will impact the whole church. You need leadership and ownership. Recognize those who God is raising up for the world ministry. In prayer, giving or going, give them responsibility and release them from all local church activity. That's what sent away means. It means these people has been sent forth. Just as the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 13, from verse 1 to 3. Let's read Acts chapter 13. Verse 1 to 3. Acts 13. 1 to 3. He said, And now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophet and teacher, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Caesarea, and Mane which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrash and Saul. And they ministered unto the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul. Remember what the Holy Spirit said there, yes, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Walk. God does not call you to sleep. He does not call you to clap your hands. He does not call you to be a good singer in the church every Sunday and be soaked in the Holy Spirit and the next Sunday will soak again. No. He called you to minister. He called you to witness. He called you to carry the gospel of the kingdom. To the four corners of the earth. That is why the Holy Spirit asks for the separation. Separate for the work. Yes, Paul and Barnabas are virtuous members in your church. In your church, you have prophets, you have teachers, you have evangelists, 
You have a preacher. But time has come that you, the pastor, should grow that church. Why the mature believer should be sent forth? Send him to where? Send him to the field. To also groom others. Paul was a great missionary. But if he has remained in that church, it will be useless to the church. And a lot of soul will be lost as dead in the world. But the Holy Spirit designed in his soul. And he made Barnabas as well. For the work he had sent them. And what did they do? After they heard this statement, and when they have fasted and prayed, after the Holy Spirit speaks, they did not just conclude and say, Oh yeah, Paul, Barnabas, the Holy Spirit has spoken it. Oh yeah, go. No. The church came together. Remember what the Bible said. Whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we lose as a church on earth is loosed in heaven. And therefore, the church came together to empower them in prayer. They came together to empower them through fasting and prayer. And after that, they laid their hands upon them. What is the importance of laying hands before they were sent forth? To empower them with power and Holy Spirit. The hand symbolizes strength. To strengthen them in difficult situations, they will meet out there in the mission. That's why in the mission, in CGL, when we are about to send forth missionaries, we indulge in prayer and fasting. And after we have fasted, we lay hand on them for the Holy Spirit and for power. And when they have received power, they are sent forth. And I tell you, they never return empty. Just like Jesus said, when the 70 return, they return with joy. And they said to him, Lord, even the devil were subject to us. Are you sending missionary into the field that ran away from the devil? Or are you sending missionary into the field that came back with tears because the church refused to back them up in prayer? Because the church did not send them to cast out them, rather he sent them for church planting. The church did not send them to bind and break all the bondage that are in the land and to lose the vision of heaven. But rather for church goals and planting. But God is asking you, what role and objective do you play in your sending missionaries? Remember when Paul and Barnabas were sent forth. The elders came together. The church gathered together around the back then. When they have prayed, they were soaked in the Holy Spirit. They were separated from the bedroom. They were sent with the wounds of the church into the open cold. They were sent with the virtues of the Holy Spirit of the church into them. And all the gifts of the church were imparted into the two of them. That's why they could prophesy. That's why they could possess all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because at that point in time, they were apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they have possessed all the gifts, they were sent into the field. And the Bible says, after they have prayed for them and fasted together, they laid hand on them and they sent them away. Because the work is not complete when you pray and fast for them. The work is complete when they are sent forth. Why do they need all those things? Why does this missionary need all your prayers and supplication? Because there is something you must understand as a Christian. Money and gifts are effective, but they are not a perfect tools for mission. Because your money can only take you to a location. But you have to live in order to spend that money. Without the Holy Spirit, you will not survive three days. And if you don't survive, your money is as useless. The people you are going to meet can decide to gather together and burn all your money. Somebody can trick you and waste all the entire mission money in a single project. At the end of the day, you will be empty. The only thing that is needed in the mission 
actually are the laying of the apostles' hand, prayer, fasting. These are the required tools for mission. And when you have been given this tool, anything else the church raises is a strength to your soul, an encouragement to prepare you for the work of the ministry. Now, why do we go to that point? In verse 4, and so they bring forth, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia from thence, and they sailed to Cyprus. They were sent forth by the Holy Ghost. This time they were separated from their family, from their wife, children. They were sent forth by the Holy Ghost to go to another town and bring Jesus to them. Their mission was to present Christ to the people. And at that point in time, they were missionary. They were not missionary when they were converted. They were not missionary because the Holy Spirit appeared to them in dream. They were missionary because they were sent on a mission. So I heard from people who claim and entitle themselves mission, missionaries, simply because the fact they have been called into it. Yes, but that doesn't make you a missionary. You are a missionary when you have a mission. And when your destination is separated by the Holy Spirit and sent forth for a targeted purpose, that's when you are a missionary. Involve the whole body on one hand, working in partnership with other churches and mission is good. And so is because in unity, blessing is combined. Because some missionary get there, they will say, What church do you belong to? One will say, I belong to this, the other one will say, I belong to Paul, the other one will say, I belong to Apollos. Some will say, I belong to this. Church A, the other one will say I belong to Church B, the other one will say I belong to Church C. How are you going to say Church A, B, C together? If we all are separated by name, if we all are separated by doctrine, if we all are separated by certificate, if we all are separated by denomination, how do we now bring the Christ before the unsaved? What happens when unbelievers begin to ask us what church or what group or what conference do you belong? What are you going to tell them? That's why in CGF we throw away boundaries, we throw away barriers, we throw away denomination for the name of Jesus Christ. We go beyond barriers, we go beyond boundaries, we go beyond church names. We go beyond doctrines. We go beyond people in order to bring Christ to all. Because Jesus did not die for names. Jesus did not die for a particular denomination. I believe Jesus died for the whole world. So our mission is to the whole world. And that is the purpose of your mission. Because without the unity of the body. And remember the first mission we had in Okbae Kingdom. We gather all the things together from various churches, the Catholic, the Anglican, the Assemblies of God, Deeper Life, even Sirobo and Seraphim. We gather all together for the gospel. Oh, we could see the move of the Holy Spirit. And the power of God came mightily upon the church. This was wonderful. Because in unity, God commanded his blessing. In division, blessings are reduced. There is no blessing commanded in division. It's when you are united. If you begin to separate yourself from believers, when you say, I am for Paul, the other one say, I am for Apollos, the other one say, I am for Jesus Christ. Who planted Apollos water? Is it Paul that go to the cross to die for you? Is it Apollos that saved you? Is it not Jesus Christ that gave the increase? Brethren, we can only be saved if we come together as a body, not as a church, 
But as Christians, people who live like Christ, who behave like Christ, and we join together in unity for the purpose that Christ sent us. He did not send us as a church. He sent us and said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Because I am with you always, even to the end of the world. You, it cannot be with you when you begin to divide yourself from one another. The unity is where the blessings are commanded in the mission. Unity is where the boundaries are broken. Where barriers and limitations are taken away. Where visions are fulfilled. When there is unity of the saints, the church triumphs. And the gate of hell can never prevail against it. But who told you the gate of hell don't prevail against a divided church? The gate of hell always prevails against a divided church. That's why you see pastor get frustrated. But a united church, the gate of hell can never prevail against it. No one church can change the world, even an unrich people by itself. The church needs one another resources. Some church are rich in wealth. Some are rich in prayer. Some are rich in deliverance. Some are rich in prophecy. Some are rich in vision. What happens when we join all this together? Some are rich in teaching. Why not join all our mandates together to save the lost? To deliver those whom Christ died for on the cross. Then you will see the dynamics of the Holy Spirit in the church. Because this is the purpose. The church did not gather together in Antioch as a divided church, but as a united church before Saul and Barnabas to be sent forth. They gathered together as a united force. And when they were sent forth, the Holy Spirit promotes his work. You need to set a goal with this. Goals release energy and set direction. The church without a goal is a, it's a dead church. You only have a name that you live, but you are dead. The church must have a goal and a vision. What is the vision of the church you belong? Apart from going to church every Sunday, sit in the front row, Promote you to deacon, then promote you to usher, then even to assistant pastor. What is your vision? What goal does your church have? What is their yearly forecast of number of souls to be converted to the ministry? What is the geographic location where members are divided up? What is the maximum year of service in your church? Does your church have maximum years of service? By which time members are released to go into various fields for the work of the ministry and to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to all nations and to proclaim unto them deliverance, healing, salvation of souls to all the earth and to preach the gospel of the kingdom to every creature and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Is that the goal of your church? Or the goal of your church is to multiply member and to increase the tight revenue. How do you assess growth in your ministry? Do you assess growth by the total inputs of income or the number of worshippers that gathered on Sunday? Or do you assess inputs by the number of missionaries that have been sent to various parts of the earth? Do you assess your growth by convert numbers? Brethren, remember, Jesus fed 5,000. 5,000 disciples were never sent out. Right at 70 and 12 were sent out. So learn to understand this. If you want to assess your church, assess by the number of disciples, you are successfully discipled who are being sent forth for the work of the ministry. 
and for the declaration of the gospel of God. If not, you only have leaves in your church, you have no fruit. If you are, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. If your target is to have 100 members, you will, in a year, you can gather all the people in the street and put them there, hoping you have members. And maybe you, all you have in your church are a group of gossipers, backbiters, haters of men, liars, deceivers. You don't have members. Even though they be one million in numbers, you still do not have one. But when you have two disciples in your church, you soak them with the word of God. You hold a mission conference, two souls came, celebrate. Spend your time. Pour the spirit of God in you into those two. And I tell you, you do not have to convert. You have to come. By the time those two go out and they witness to their native town and their villages, catching every vision from your mouth, you will have entire village for yourself. You will no longer have to convert. But by the time you hold a conference, 100,000 came. And the one that came, came to see Superman. Or they came to see magician who performs on spiritual tricks. And they are gone. And when they are gone, nothing happened. You don't have any combat. All your vision, your revelation, your preaching, your message, they are all vanity. And there is no soul, no fruits to be recorded. Not before God, not before man. Your time is wasted. You say, but they come to church every Sunday. They pay tax. They pay offer. They are giving. But what about their soul? What have you given to their soul? How prepared are they to meet with the Lord on the last day? How secure are they? Where is their heavenly mansion? Can you point to one? Or does your heavenly mansion not equate their own? How many rooms do your member have in their heavenly mansion? Prayers cover for mission. Say special hours, at least once a week. Pastoral contacts, care for vulnerable frontline missionary workers, awareness training for the church. Say an information slot every Sunday. Is where church member pledges a certain gift for mission to be paid over the following years as God provides in answers to their prayer. Over and above their normal income, business and mission have always been two paths, two pairs in the same pole. Short term missionary trips for visiting other cultures and each year missionary sending. Say at least a tax, 1% of the church might go. See other lessons. This is how we prepare for a missionary church. <coughs> it's not, I am not against you wanting to build a big house. But don't worry, your mansion in heaven, there are many. And you don't need it on earth. Reserve the money and income for heavenly mansion, which the Lord will give them that love is up here. Use the income that you have on earth for the work of the ministry and to promote the kingdom of God. You need a spirit-led strategy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul said, he is a master builder. What is a master builder? Is Sophos architecture in Greek. What is a wise architect or a planner who gets wisdom from God through the word and the spirit? What was that wisdom? Paul strategy for mission. What was Paul's strategy? Let's study it. Paul's missionary strategy was to go down the main road 
of the main adulterous cities or idolatrous city, what you call idol worshipping towns. That was his mission strategy. His job was not to go about from town to town looking for tree to cut or for idol to burn. That was not his mission. His doctrine was to convert them, to make them know that there is God who they do not know, that the idols may worship in ignorance, that in days of ignorance God overlook, but God has commanded all men to come to repentance. Discover where and amongst which people group God was moving. <clears throat> and walk with them till they were saved, matured and ministering themselves. That was his strategy. And that strategy is the strategy of CGF. We move around, although we focus on worldwide mission, not a specific route like Paul did. But we discovered where and amongst whom people God was moving. And we walk with them until they were saved. And we put them in a discipling class and mature them until they themselves are qualified to be missionary and minister themselves. This his model foundation for mission has two major parts: world-minded mother churches. In the Bibles, the only difference we see between a church and Geographical ones like the church in Jerusalem, the church in Antioch, the Philippines, the Ephesus, who gave birth to and supported the local and missionary activity to spread the gospel. Antioch was Paul Mother Church. He went, he was sent out from there. And he returned there for much of his missionary career. So the same thing could be in your church today. The place you, from which you are sent forth is your mother church. You can only return there for prayer, for gathering resources, for material. The apostolic thing, apostolic means sent by God. Not necessarily led by an apostle, as even Paul was not recognized as such at this time. When God called him to go on his mission, he formed a small apostolic team of three with its own clear strategy for the unrich. In Acts 13, verse 1, there was his practice from then on. In Acts chapter 20, let's read Acts 20 verse 4. Acts 20 verse 4. And ye accompany him unto Asia, Sopata of Baria, and the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Debe, and Timotheus of and of Asia, Tachikos and Trophimus. This going before tarry for us at Troas. In verse 6, he said, We sailed away from Philippi after the days of the unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas the fifth day. Where we abode seven days. So it was a constant missionary journey in the case of Paul and his team of missionaries. No wonder they were more vast than the rest of the missionaries who did their work from town to town. The team has to be economically self sufficient. How? Once on the road, they were self-governing, self-funding, self-propagating, as they in turn formed new churches, schools, mission team, 
one goes, two approaches. All these things were made to, one, to help the locals, two, to provide income formation. Thank God for mission like CGF, we have been self-funding for the past 10 years in the nation. And God has always helped us with strategy. How do we self fund By labor. We gather income from our labor and we are able to use it to support the mission in the onset, rather than going about with plates begging for donations. So the apostles were self-governing, self-funding, and self-propagating. If the apostle could do it, I believe your mission team can do it today. So just steps as God's guide. A team goes and seeks, spies, return, and the team pray a lot, and then goes again, worship on sites, take people, and learn about them and return. The team goes and stays. First of all, all the members learn the local way, slide into a new culture, adapt their message so locals understand. They begin to witness and win the new believer who they form into the church. The team disciples the new believers as soon as possible and appoints local elders. Then the church sends a team of locals to the next village. And so, the new church is a missionary church from day one. The last step is to hand over the new church to the local people for the original team to go to the next place. And this is exactly the same strategy we have in CGF. And that is why our mission has always been successful wherever we send them to a locality. And this analyzes the steps. You can also follow the same variation in terms of your mission. Today, what is your mission strategy? And that is the question you have to ask yourself. Does your church have a definite strategy to save life? Are you ready to send your team into the location where souls can be truly one? Or you are a missionary that is waiting for support before you go for mission? Sorry. You do not only have God to fighting on behalf of the mission. We also have an opposing thought of Satan contending with the missionaries. What happened when Satan decided to confront and attack the mission in the area of needs? Will you still be able to stand your ground and say to the devil, I don't care if I have no income, I don't care if I have no resource, I will go for the work, I will have more than enough in the field, the Lord will provide for me. I will use my skill. I will use my wisdom. And I will use the knowledge that God has given me to raise support and income for the work. Brethren, that is what the apostle did. What about you? Are you limited from going out because your church is not rich enough to finance the work that God has called you to? Are you limited in saving souls? Because you have no conviction that once you are there, that the church cares enough to be able to look after your various mission needs. Most of us, we are afraid of the same thing. When the Lord called us, we sat down, not knowing what to do, having no body to learn from, no experience whatsoever from anyone. But we trusted in the Lord. And today, we are still in the field. That's why most of us have to travel from time to time to work and labor and raise income for the work of the mission before we return. But God is gradually building us into a team that will not have to leave or to go and raise support, but to be able to raise local support and do the work of the mission and accomplish the purpose why God sent us. In verse 25, then they departed Barnabas to Tarsus. 
to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and touched much people. And the disciple were called Christian first in Antioch. Why was the disciple called Christian in Antioch? Unity. Christ-like behavior. Attitude of a Christian. Character. Not a religious badge. Today we have many Christians who carry a badge of religion on their chest. Even some requirement for job. Are you a Muslim or Christian? Oh, I'm a Christian. To them it's a religious badge. Christian is not a custom. Like other custom. Christianity is a way of life. And Christianity is neither a religious activity. It is a Christ character he has come to show to the world. In it, there is no Muslim, there is no Christian, there is no Greek, there is no Buddha, there is no Hebrew, and there is no. Christ is all, and all is Christ. And that is what the purpose of mission is. Until you tend to understand this, you will minister as a limited Christian. You will pastor as a limited Christian. You will reach out as a limited Christian. You will not be able to save anybody. But all your visions in life will be limited. But if you want to be a Christian, you must first of all put behind you the garment of religions. Because religion is just an apron by which the world tends to cover themselves. Christians don't belong to a particular sect. Christians belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. Anyone that belongs to God belongs to Christ. So, if you love God, so you say, I love God, but I don't want Christ. If you love God, you should love the Son as well. For He proceeds from His, from his Father. And how? Because the Bible said to us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, the Word of God came from God's speaker. If you believe God exists, you should believe that His word exists. Except you believe that your God is an idol or some more false being that do not move, that have no ability to speak. Christ is God's speaking word. And the Bible says His word can become flesh. His word became flesh. It is not any other thing. His, the word of God was made flesh. He became flesh because God has the ability to make his word a living soul. We knew that in Genesis when he created man. If you understand Genesis, you should understand how man, how God's son came to be. How does man came to be? Man was fashioned and molded from clay. God breaks into him. The breath of God makes him a living soul. The breath of God kicked the machine of the heart started. The breath of God sustained the machine of the heart. Man was able to reproduce his kind. Man was able to give name to all the beasts of the field. Wisdom developed from the breath of God. Then if that is possible, why is it impossible for you to understand that God's word can become flesh? When it was written by the prophets that a virgin shall be with a child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And what is the meaning of Emmanuel? God living with us. Are you going to determine that you don't also believe in Isaiah the prophet? Or believe Moses who said in the last day God will send a prophet like me? Him, would you hear? So, why is it impossible for you to believe that God has one son who he begotten by his voice and he made him a missionary and sent him to the world for the perpetuation for sin that many who believe in him should not be condemned irrespective of your race, religious or doctrine that you might have eternal life that is the message Jesus only should be your message 
Jesus or your team should be. Save your sanctifier. I am not here to preach to you, church. We don't preach church in CGF. We preach Christ. Because the church or the people did not die for you. But Christ did. And there is no salvation in other name. There is no name given under heaven. And there is no book under heaven by which you can be saved. Other than the name Jesus Christ. If you believe and repent, you shall be saved, you and your house. But if you believe not, you are condemned already. Not because he was sent to condemn the world, because you did not believe that God is able to make his word flesh. And you have no confidence in God. And that is why you are condemned. But if you have confidence that God is able to transform his word into flesh and has sent him in the person of Christ Jesus, you have life everlasting. And that is life everlasting. That God has one son and he made him a missionary for your sake. That he may bring all men to God. It is not his will that anyone should perish, whether the person be wicked or good. But his will is that all men should leave their evil ways and return to repentance. That is the will of God concerning you. And that is why he first sent his son to bless your heart, to transform you. And to make you his choosing vessel. To prepare you an eternal destiny. And he said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I have gone. He has been gone for 2,000 years. And he's preparing a place for you. And I believe he will so return. And when he returns, he will take you to himself. So where he is, the air will his servant be also. And they shall worship him. And they shall see his face. And he shall be the source of a living water for them. He shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. They shall hunger no more, taste no more. Nor shall the sun or the heat light upon them anymore. Because to them, the land which is the devotion of the Father shall be their light. They will need no more sun. But this is a hope he has prepared for you. That's why the Lord says, I know the thoughts I have towards you. They are thoughts of good. They are not of evil. His thought is to give you an expected end. There is end he expects for you. He has prepared it. He has beautified it. Mm -hmm. And that is the end he is expecting to give to everyone that love his gracious appearing. But brethren, let's ask you one simple question. Today, do you love his appearing? Will you be happy when he appears in the air? Or will you be disappointed? And that is the question for you to answer. Remember what he said to the children of Israel. I have said before your life and death, blessing and cursing. And I cancel you like a good father. Don't choose cause. Choose life that you and your children might live. That your generation might survive. God does not send his son to condemn the world. He sent his son that through him all might be saved. Today, that light is set before you. You have a choice in the world. You have opportunity to choose death. You have opportunity to choose life. But God is begging you through the death of his son. If he doesn't love you, he will not have sent his son to die. The Bible says he be form of a God. He did not see it as a thing of robbery. To be equal with God. But he humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. And he became obedient unto death. Even such a shameful death on the cross. Just think about him. Who has endured such contradiction for sin for himself. You should not be weary. You should not faint in your mind. But let us serve the Lord with fear. With humility let us kiss his son. So that when he appears he will not be angry. Or else we perish in the way. Will you fight against God? Are you stronger than him? Can you contend with him in battle? Can you stand against his rod? The Bible says the great days of his rod when he comes, who is able to stand? Not the governments of the world. Not the politicians of the world. Not the mighty men. Not the great captain. Not servant. Not widow. None is able to stand the days of his rod. Brethren, today is the appointed time. Now is the day of salvation. 
God is building up a missionary church. Will you be among them? God is choosing his people, selecting them to finish his great commission, to prepare home for his return. Will you be among the church? Will you be the number one among those who the Lord is calling? If you want to be today, God just said, you should come to him, all you that labor, and are tired of laboring in vain. Come, I will give you rest. Come learn from me, my yoke is easy, my body is light. God is calling you. He's calling you from all over the world. He's calling you from all over the planet. Come, all you that labor. Come, all you that labor so hard. I will give you rest. Come and lean on me. My yoke is easy. My body is light. And I will give rest to your soul. Are you ready to lean on Christ? Are you ready? When Christ returns today, will you be prepared? Will you be a bridegroom? God is not coming to condemn the world. He's coming for a bride that will have spots. A bride that has not been stained with the world. A bride that is separated from the world. Have you allowed the addition of the world of sin to attach to your Christian garment? The Lord is calling you today. That you should still have the chance. He is standing at the door in Revelation. And he's knocking. And he is saying to you, if any man hear his voice and open the door, he will come into him. He will eat with him and he with him. Oh, the Lord is asking you that you should come to him that is naked. Come and buy white rabbits. Oh, the children of Adam and Eve think by eating the fruit of knowledge that they will become wise. But rather they ate nakedness to themselves. And in nakedness the Lord still called them. Because the Lord wants to clothe them. He makes sack clothes to cover them. He made the garment of he killed an innocent animal to make some animal skin to cover them. The Lord is telling you, it is only by the grace of God you can be covered. Tonight, God is asking you to buy white garments, purified, and that you might be clean. That your iniquity do not expose before the world. Let all the world see your shame. When the Lord return, keep your garments so that no man will see your shame. The Lord is asking you that you should come, you that claim you see, that you should come and buy a slave for him, so that you can anoint your eyes so that you might see. The Lord is calling you, you that think you are rich in this world, you should come and buy gold for him, that is refined in finance, purify seven times and make white, so that you might be rich, so that your poverty do not expose to the world. Brethren, if you have accepted these terms, just say this short prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I know I have been foolish all my life and I return to you. Today, accept me as one of I have confidence in you and I believe that you are the Son of God. You died for me according to the scripture. You rose again for my justification. Now I believe in you. If you have said this short prayer, you just saved your life. And God is ready to welcome you with the rest of the saints into the body of Christ. Join our mission practice. Train for yourself so that you can make your heavenly mansion more beautiful. God bless you as a listen. This is where we end our today's teaching. Before we conclude, let us pray. Father, we thank you once again. We exalt and honor the Lord who has given us hope in the midst of hopelessness. Who has given us strength in the place where men are weak. The Lord who has prepared us for a wonderful evening. The Lord who has trained our hands to walk. The Lord who has blessed the work of our hands. The Lord who healed the sick. The Lord who raised the dead. The Lord who gathered souls to his name. The Lord who can do exceedingly above what we can think, ask or imagine. Father Lord, that your people are expecting. Meet every one of them at the very expectation of their names. And at the very point of their names. And let your name alone be exalted. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brethren. You are welcome to join us next week, Tuesday, by 7 p.m. Swedish time or 8 p.m. Nigeria time. And you are also welcome to our Sunday Understanding Prophecy Training, where we use the opportunity to expose the entire Bible prophecy and the book of Revelation. And God bless you as you participate. The time is 5 p.m. Sunday evening. And... Our open house fellowship is 7 p.m. Tuesday. 
So God bless you as you participate. And the end, the last Tuesday of every month is our tarry night, where we use the opportunity to pray for all the churches in the world and to pray for all missionaries and Christians around the world who are serving the Lord. God, you can submit your prayer request. You can consult us by going through our website at cgfnslogin.app or info at cgfnslogin.app. God bless you as you participate. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.